All right, there we go. Let's get our Facebook friends up in here before it is time to start the show. We got the wheels spinning and we got one and two. All right, welcome in, welcome in. It is Tuesday evening, the 19th of March. Happy spring, Carl. How you doing? Did you get a haircut? What's going on? You look a little bit, uh, not, not something going on. You're looking good. How you doing? Well, I, I kind of forgot my hat. I went for a run before the show and didn't flow. grab my, yeah, it is. <laughs> I, you know, I had to do my hair nice today. Had a, okay. a work thing that I was all dressed up in a nice suit, everything. Um, kind of messed up the, uh, person i was visiting was a huge ku fan and i wore purple like k-state and okay. my bad my bad i'm sorry to the family <laughs> that's okay but no I, I just i look good in purple i don't like k-state but i look good in purple i mean you gotta love the uh, a-hole good joke for those at home they have manhattan spelled out and carl loved to hang out in the a-hole speaking of hanging out with a-holes <laughs> welcome to the broncos for breakfast guys we love you i uh, hope our excuse me Building the Broncos, I'm on autopilot with uh, the lack of sleep from uh, the dad life for the newborn, but we're doing well. Let's say hello to some people in the chat as we get this show rolling. One of always our first commenters in these shows, David Youngkin, coming in here saying, Evening, everyone. Hope everyone is having a great day. Wish we get Brock Bowers and Bo Nix in the draft, but I just don't see it happening. I think it's possible. I think that Bo Nix is not going to go at 12 overall. I don't even think he's going to go in the top 20, personally. Now, crazy things happen, of course, but... When I and Carl and I, we're a lot of times on the same wavelength. We see Bonix a little differently. That's okay. And uh, that was a little bit of a Trump impersonation. That's okay. Uh, but uh, <laughs> that's a. Uh, I think there's very there's a possibility you could take Brock Bowers at twelve and then trade into day two using seventy six and a twenty twenty five second to go get Bowers. I think that's a possibility. Uh, honestly, the one who I think is not going to be there right now is Bowers. It sounds like after the Jets moves in the last what week. They are circling in on Bowers. I wouldn't be shocked if they took a pass or a pass protector either, uh, but I think it'll probably end up being Bowers for them at ten after the the moves they've made. Yeah, they they seem to be like a team that's saying we're going to take all the risk that we need to do to go win a championship. And taking a guy that might be on the bench, you know, an offensive tackle that you're you're hoping in, and you'd be using that maybe for the the Tyron Smith if he gets hurt. You're kind of worried about that. The rest of your offensive line has some injury concerns as well. Um, so maybe it's not the the win now kind of move, but it's the win from now on. Great move. But Bowers is the, hey, we need more weapons to really just challenge teams and give Aaron Rodgers the best chance. And so, yeah, I'm with you. I think if you're going to maximize having Aaron Rodgers and say we've got probably at most a two-year window with him before he probably retires – if that with Aaron Rodgers, you just never know. I mean, that, that guy could play yeah. for the next 10 years or he could decide I'm done halfway through the season. I, I never know with him. Uh, but still, like I said, if you really are that locked in, Brock Bowers is probably that guy for you. Yeah, I I personally would probably go with a pass protector there considering they what they have going on uh, and kick Simpson, their left guard around if, by taking Fatno or Fuaga, who give you a lot of... Uh, tackle guard versatility but that's just me i'm a little bit uh, as soon as i have the dad i become a offensive line boomer offensive line obsessed uh for especially when you have the older quarterback like that dtr is in here says all in all fairness there isn't a tight end on the roster that denver is contractually committed to but i don't think it's a priority position that they could use a first round pick on at the end of the day there's so much you know fun talk about team building and draft philosophy and positional value and where the team is and where the team is not but it's pretty simple at the end of the day. You got to get good players and you got to get difference makers. Now, the levels of difference makers you need based on the position, that's true. If you take Bowers at 12, he needs to be borderline Hall of Fame, in my opinion, as a tight end because the hit rate on tight end historically is not good. Uh, you can find good tight ends day two, day three, even a lot of times. So it's there's a there's a an opportunity cost for an offensive tackle, for an edge rusher, for a defensive lineman, for a quarterback by going tight end in the first round. So I think that the, the margins there are much smaller. You just have, there's, there's much, there's just a much smaller area of where he needs to be at his play level to be worth that pick. But that said, if you evaluate him as a difference maker, perennial, all uh, perennial pro bowler with all pros splashed in there, you know, two, three, four years, that's worth it. But that's, that's the same argument, Carl. I've got, I feel like we all eventually we have the same conversation again. It's the same thing we talked about with Quentin Nelson at five years and years ago. If he's a hall of famer, Sure. The pathway to reach Hall of Fame, regardless of the draft status, is small. 
So yeah. how what's the likelihood of that happening? Because that's what it needs to be to be worth that pick. I'm with you there. Uh, you know, and I was trying to think. So where were all, Travis Kelsey was the third rounder or was he a second rounder? I think he was a third rounder. Third rounder. George Kittle was a fifth rounder. One pick after Jake Butt. That's right. <laughs> I wasn't going to say that part, but, uh, you know, I, I'm Mark Andrews was a second rounder. So I'm looking at a lot of these tight ends. Been, round two. Yeah. I mean, TJ Hawkinson, he was a first rounder. I'll give it Eight to overall. him. Yep. But it took him a few years before he ever really became what he is today. Uh, he, he was good as a rookie, but he's great now. And and so you always have that worry with tight end. It's one of those positions that really doesn't translate day one in the NFL well. Now, I think a Bowers kind of guy where he's a receiving option and the way that he played the college game, I think he's one of the few if you get him into a good situation, which the New York Jets would be a really good situation. I think he could be a great player. I, I just worry, especially here in Denver, where you're taking Bowers at 12. Okay, that probably... The, the chances of getting your quarterback then become very, very slim. And yeah. then he's having Jarrett Stidham as his starting quarterback for this season. And then you're probably not able to even maximize that, that kind of talent on the field. So that's yeah. where I just, I don't see how that lines up well for the Broncos for this upcoming season. That said, if he can be an elite difference maker as a weapon, I don't care what position you are. I think the, now, granted, they're in a totally different part of their team building process than the Broncos. But last season, we kind of saw it with the both the Falcons and the uh, gosh, the Lions, where they take running backs early. And we'll see how that works in hindsight. But I think you need to evaluate those weapons like as a wide receiver. Is he if let's say we change this position of this player and we made him a wide receiver, would he still be worth that pick? It's I don't care. He's running back one tight end, whatever. If he was a wide receiver. And yeah. the contract that goes with the wide receiver is he worth that pick? And yes, we can have that conversation for sure. But I think yeah. you have to evaluate it, the offensive weapon as a whole. And a lot of times you probably want to lean the wide receiver. And that doesn't even get into the cost benefit of the rookie contract stuff from a wide receiver compared to a tight end compared to a running back. So right. Again, right. if they view him as a perennial all pro guy who's a Hall of Fame grade player, you know, blue chip all the way, sure. I don't know if I see that. I have questions, especially, you know, he comes to the combine 243. Oh, I'm not going to test now. Georgia Pro Day, no weight, no testing of the hamstring. Are you a, what, what, what are you, Bowers? I mean, a lot of good player. A lot of it's scheme touch, though, right? I just, so he's very good. I think it's a little bit more of a cherry on top conversation for the Broncos for where they sit in the current team building process when you need defensive line, you need offensive line, you need quarterback, you need wide receiver. I mean, just, it just feels way too much end of the team building process, which like the Jets kind of are versus where the Broncos are, which was a complete teardown. Right. And, and you know, you're talked about Detroit taking running back early this last year and, and some of the non-premium positions. And I kind of look at it as they, they were on a team on the, the uprise. Like they, they had a lot of the premium positions locked down well. So it gave them a little bit more ability to, to go in that kind of direction. You know, it's kind of like the chiefs when they took a running back in the first round, now, obviously, Clyde Edwards-Hilaire didn't quite work out for them, but they had a little bit more luxury to go make that kind of move compared to, like you said, where the Broncos are at right now, where you just you might not be able to truly maximize that kind of talent at this point when, you know, a, a true left tackle, if you decide to move on from Garrett Bowles. Maybe that's how you get your second round pick is you trade Garrett Bowles. But then you have this giant hole at the left tackle spot that is such a premium position that you need for any young quarterback coming in. Um, so that's why I don't really want to do that. If, if At this point, I'd rather just go ahead and keep Garrett Bowles than open up a hole. Um, but I, I hole? guess I know. Well, yeah, the A-hole. Yeah. <laughs> And why are we talking about so much about Bowers? Well, thank you, DTR, for the comment. But uh, Daniel Jeremiah, not a lot, a man of a lot of words in these uh, mock drafts, but I wish I could be as succinct. I know Chad wishes I could be as succinct. Uh, says, uh, Broncos picking 12. I know the tight end is not a pressing need for the Broncos, but this is the best player available situation that can deploy Bowers in the slot, similar to the way Sean Payton utilized Michael Thomas in New Orleans. I don't mind it. I think it's uh, Jason Bishop does a good job covering the Broncos as well. He's mentioned a Puka Nakua kind of role where he's a big, you know, inside outside slot guy who's physical at the catch point. 
Again, if you evaluate him and you think he is as not just a, you know, a tight end, but a wide receiver caliber playmaker. Sure. Even though you're going to lose the stuff, but I just lose the contract value of the rookie contract, but I don't know. So shout out to Daniel Jeremiah for the mock and a Brock Bowers pick there. I feel like people, I appreciate Daniel Jeremiah because I'm getting kind of tired of the constant. Well, Denver can't get up for one of the top four quarterbacks. So here's Bo Nix again. Uh, but we'll get into that in a second, of course. And I know you're more okay with that than I am. Um, but I want to say a little bit more stats. Yeah, yeah, I got some stats for you that I wanted to run by and just maybe give a little bit bigger picture of okay. Bo Nix I, and why I think he'd be a good fit for Denver. Well, let's, uh, we'll get into it here in a second. I do want to say a yeah. lot of some more folks in here. Daniel Berry, yo, how you doing? Good to see you, Daniel. We've got a guy, Dylan Von Arks, in the house saying, sup, Rockland's country. Make sure you guys hit that like button on the way in. Thank you so much. Drop, uh, drop a super chat, too, Dylan. No, I'm just kidding. We love you, Dylan. Uh, William says, I never once thought about tight end in the first. You can get quality ones second and third. Yeah, it's not the best tight end class this year. Honestly, I think the value in tight end is day three this season uh, for some developmental guys. I really like uh, Tipman out of Illinois. Uh, Wiley out of TCU. Uh, there's some value there. We'll see what happens with guys like Theo Johnson and Ben Sinat, uh, as well. I guess I probably should say the schools, Penn state and Kansas state talking about Kansas state twice today, uh, with you there, Carl. <laughs> but, uh, I think probably it's a day three pop proposition for me. And listen, I know that, you know, it was George Payton talking about and Mike Cliss saying they really need to add a pass catcher at tight end. The list of the Broncos needs is longer than they can possibly fill this season. It's, it's not going to happen. So, you take what's available to you. So you're going to go into the season with still things on the shopping list. That's okay. That's just where you're at right now with the dead cap it and the team building Charlie Foxtrot uh, that has uh, happened the last three ish seasons for the Broncos, two seasons for sure for the Broncos. So right. we'll see they can get a quality tight in the second and third. They don't have a second round pick right now. And they only have one third. So it's, it's a hard spot for the Broncos. It's not going to make or break the season. <sighs> Yeah, I'm with you there. And I think it was Mike Clay ranked the Broncos as the, as the third worst roster in football right now. And that's just part of the teardown. You know, when you're getting rid of guys like Justin Simmons, who right now could be a big help to this roster. But if you're trying to look two, three years down the road and trying to figure out your cap situation, then it makes sense. Okay, let's go ahead and get rid of this. We're not, not again, you're getting rid of some talent and that hurts that's going to be a part of this process of growing is it's you're going to go through the growing pains and people are going to have to be okay with the fact, like you said, there's going to be some major holes on this team that are going to have to be thought of two, three years down the road compared to today. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's going to be interesting to see what happens there for sure. But I'm curious. I think Bowers will go 10. I, it's not the move I would make given he's a small player who didn't test. And I, just the historical precedent for tight end. But like you mentioned, the Jets, they have a two-year window. That can add a lot to them, especially for a veteran quarterback. Having a veteran quarterback, I think it's really beneficial to have a smorgasbord of weapons where they can kind of pick and choose their matchups. If you have a young guy, give them a number one and let them spam it <laughs> all yeah. day long. But for having a veteran guy, giving them you know a bunch of number twos, uh, I think it's a way to go. We got Barry McCockner coming in here saying trade back, grab a second with a trade, and then draft Knicks later in the first. Cecil Lamy's head will explode if we take a quarterback in the 20s. Well, I don't want Cecil's head to explode. You always got a nice uh, flow going on out there. And I like uh, Cecil's a great guy. So I don't want that to happen. Uh, but heck, I we'll see what happens. I think we've seen it, Carl, the last three seasons. Now, it used to be, oh, you got to get that fifth-year option on that quarterback. How many times are you actually seeing the fifth-year option utilized on quarterbacks these days? I don't think it really matters so much. It's so expensive for the quarterback. So, I mean... 20, 40, I don't know. Pick him where you value him. If you like him so much and you can get him a trade back, that's fine. But I think this is really setting up to a Drew Lock situation where they're like, oh, Broncos, Drew Lock at 10, Drew Lock at 10. Trade back twice or uh, take him with the next second round pick to end up getting him in the end. I think that's probably where this heads, in my opinion. But again, I just do not see a first round caliber prospect uh, in Bonix given the. Really, it's the big thing is the arm talent, but it's the arm talent in combination with the question marks from tape with the age uh, for me. Yeah, I, the teams that are signing those quarterbacks to a long term deal, like I said, it seems like they're doing it during the fourth year mm -hmm. and not doing the fifth year option and just saying, hey, we're going to try to get this done as soon as possible because we're seeing how much these contracts are just exploding. Mm -hmm. So it's better to go ahead and get this locked in at 
45 million today instead of 55 million two years from now kind of yeah. thing. So we got Riptide coming in with the $2 super saying, no matter what happens at 12, someone will be mad. That's true, man. That's life, right? I mean, let's say it's, I mean, there's probably guys who the people wouldn't be mad. Like, uh, let's say Drake may fell, fell to 12 or something. I think people would be pretty happy about that. Marvin Harrison Jr. at 12. Sure. In the land of reality, not the land of make believe over here though, there's going to be different opinions. And I will say that some people will be proven right and wrong. I've been proven wrong plenty of times doing this. That's the reality of the situation. And that's okay. Uh, we'll see how it plays out when it happens. The one thing I always take away is that it's fun to get worked up and mad about things that really don't matter. Right? Like, yeah. I mean, it's, maybe we should focus our energy and time elsewhere. Don't do that, folks. Don't turn the dial off. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, stuff that, like, it's outside the control. The, lean into that tribalism a little bit. You know, the opinions. Uh, get riled up. That's fine. Uh, so, yeah, some folks will be mad. That's okay. I'm not mad with Riptide coming with a $2 Super Chat. Thank you so much for the support, Riptide. Sorry we were five minutes late. You got to give. I know he's always one that wants a punctuality. I remember that, Riptide. Uh, but I got a newborn, and that makes it pretty hard sometimes. So uh, <laughs> a little grace for this guy. Uh, por favor. Yeah, that, that's for sure. <clears throat> I, I remember after having a kid, if you didn't like plan like 30 minutes ahead of time to give you like that 30-minute window – you were going to be late to everything and doesn't matter because then, yeah. you, then you know, you have that 30 minutes and you act differently before that. <sighs> All right. Well, that's a <laughs> case. Okay, that's, that's a different podcast. Yes, it is. We, yeah. we can have a dad podcast someday. Uh, Corey Johnson. How about the arm length and wingspan of offensive tackle Patrick Paul out of Houston? Yeah. Really interesting guy. Uh, a lot of, I think he studies Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, some sort of martial arts, uh, came from Africa, wants to go back and do work there as well after he's done with his career. Sounds like a really just a well put together young man. I think that his tape is a little bit concerning sometimes with the uh, landing of his punches and the ability to sustain blocks, but the movement skills plus the size, he's going to go in the top 50, in my opinion. They just don't make many that size. There's one reason that NFL teams do a pretty good job evaluating offensive tackles. If you go through PFF or the all pros of the Pro Bowl list, it's some crazy percentage of those guys are former first round picks. Why? There's only a certain, it's tangible evidence first off, but there's only a certain amount of people who have the athleticism, size, arm length, mass that walk this earth that could even qualify to be a good tackle. So deep tackle class, I think maybe last season, Paul might've worked his way up into the first round. This year is so many offensive linemen. I'm thinking somewhere round two for him. Uh, the Broncos trade back and got him or did some maneuvering to have him. That, that'd be a lot of fun. Uh, Thought he just did okay at the Senior Bowl, but he's still, I think he's got some uh, potential still, uh, without a doubt, with the size and athleticism he has. Yeah. Yep. Uh, more people coming in here. Mike Woodward coming in saying, could you imagine Broncos quarterback room of Stidham, Pratt, and Danucci? Yeah, I would be uh, looking forward to 2025 quarterbacks, baby, if that was the case. Uh, <laughs> Pratt is interesting, I got to say. I don't know, Senior Bowl watching him. I think he had an injury this season, but like the ability to drive the football, it's just not there. And when I say drive the football, when you watch enough quarterbacks, eventually the only way I can describe it is that it almost looks like the guys who have arm talent are throwing a different football. It's like, it's a heavier football. It has more velocity on the downward arc. If that makes sense, where some quarterbacks, you see him push the ball and it flutters. It's just like, Oh my God, get there, get there. Uh, Pratt, especially, I don't know if he was injured this year, but driving the foot and he throws a beautiful nine ball arm strength is not how far you can throw it. Honestly, it's how quickly they can get it from a to B it's velocity. It's ability to hit those tight windows outside the hash marks, opposite hash mark. Uh, so I don't really know if I see if let's say you took Pratt in the fifth. Okay. Right. You're developing a yeah. backup there with Pratt at that point, but uh, that would not be very exciting. And uh, probably be some empty stadiums for Broncos country next season or some empty seats for sure. I, I... I was just talking to somebody about this earlier today, and I said it, it's kind of like golf. There's some of those guys that can just hit it 300 yards, and it looks like it's nothing to them. And then you got those other guys that it looks like they're having to use their entire body with everything they've got to try to hit that ball to, to keep up. And Pratt's one of those guys that just looks like he has to put his entire body into those, those kind of passes where it's not just a natural zoop, and it's there. You know, They just flip their wrist, and it's, it's made it. Um, so I'm with you. The, the arm talent's not quite there. 
And like I said, when you watch enough of these guys, you can just tell. Like some guys, it's just so easy. And they don't have to sacrifice accuracy to throw it hard. But a lot of these other guys, just because, again, they're having to put their whole body into it, mechanics begin to fall apart. And so then it's just hit and miss of how how well they throw it into those tight windows. Yep. Yeah, it's the ability to hit the the tight windows with time and touch with arm talent is tough. Now you want quarterbacks who have the ability to not only have the fastball, but also work in the changeup. I guess with guys like Mahomes even have a curveball <laughs> in there as well. Uh, but I think if quarterbacks at least show the fastball, you have the hope that they can develop the changeup. If they don't have the fastball, it's probably not coming. It's a matter of enough out there. And I think a lot of times people, we talk about the tools of the ceiling, but I think the tools argument rings even more true for the floor, right? Again, we talk, yeah. bringing it back to our Quentin Nelson conversation earlier, you give yourself a wider range of possible outcomes when you can lean on tools. You don't have to be the best, most accurate quarterback of all time, or the smartest quarterback in the NFL or the best pocket movement of all time. If you can lean on some sort of athleticism, some semblance of arm talent. Now, Again, that won't get it done for you in the end, but there's a reason that there's not many small, weak-armed quarterbacks going in the first round. We kind of know what a great quarterback looks like. Now, they come in different shapes and sizes, and there's different areas where they're good or not, uh, but the NFL is still pretty good at evaluating the haves and the have-nots at the quarterback position from a tangible tools perspective. Now, the Sean Payton will tell you himself, the evaluation side of things, the processing side of things, it's hard. I mean, not to, I'll give Bonix a little credit here. Justin Herbert was so freaking hard to evaluate coming out of Oregon because it is RPO screen game to death. There is just, he's not being asked to make many NFL throws. It's RPO action, fake handoff action, throw it quickly to the outside. Didn't have to maneuver the pocket. Didn't have to go through multiple reads. Didn't have to throw it through in tight windows. Can he do it? We see now, yes, the NFL, the tape at Oregon. I don't know. Same thing with Marcus Mariota. Oh, the athleticism, blah, blah, blah. Doesn't have the arm talent. Not really good in the pocket. Not really good at the processing. So it's it's just, there's so many things we can't answer from where we sit that makes me concerned for something like that where I will lean on the tangibles because it is a tangible, right? We can see it. We can touch it. We can yeah. taste it. We can measure it. Right. End of, well, and, end of sermon. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. I'll I'll, uh, I'll add an ending to it here. And like I said, the, the, uh, the things that we can't tell, we can't tell how they do on the board, how quickly they can diagnose a defense, pre-snap, post-snap, all those kind of things. Oh, I mean, you, you can tell a little here and there. But especially at the college game where they have everything so spread out, a lot of quick first read systems – where these quarterbacks are not having to make a ton of big decisions, not having to go through their reads and find the open guy, um, not having to tell, hey, this defense is coming from a, a too deep safety to all of a sudden they're doing a cover one robber, you know, right at post snap ability. And, and so um, those are the kind of things that coaches could do in these private meetings. You know, it's why I, of all the quarterbacks, I want Bo Nix to be the guy that comes in for a, a private meeting with the Broncos where they get an entire day with that guy just to sit with a, on a board with him. Like I, I don't need to see him on the field. I, I know what he is on the field. I know what he can do and he can't do, but I, I really need to see, okay, if we tell you, Hey, this is what they're doing on defense. This is what, what are you going to do on offense? If this is the kind of play we call it and see how quickly he can diagnose that. Um, you know, how quickly can he pick up a playbook? Uh, I was reading about a, a pro earlier today. He was talking about NFL playbooks. And he said, it is, <laughs> it's like learning a whole new language. And some guys are great at it and other guys are terrible at it. And some guys never even work at it. And that, you know, like Paxton Lynch, he had a lot of athletic tools, but he never had a mind for the game. He had a, he never had a drive to be good at the game either. You know, he just, he was one of those guys, he relied on his natural talent for years because you can get away with that in high school, big time. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I've seen plenty of incredible athletes thrive at the quarterback position. They don't have to read a defense. They don't have to make any kind of decisions. They just have to, hey, if this guy's open, I throw it to him. If not, I'm going to take off running. College, you can still do a lot of that. But NFL, that is where that huge gap happens. 
you can no longer just be an athlete that's playing quarterback and be able to be successful unless you're Michael Vick. But <laughs> yeah, he's one of the few rare exceptions, I would say, at that kind of position. And even then, it's a floor a floor discussion, right? Yeah. He just that's it. He you have that where you can lean on no matter what. Uh, David Young can coming in says everyone is saying trade back. That's fine. But the Broncos could miss out on Knicks completely. So stay where you are, get the best player available and keep our picks for next draft. I think that if you trade back, you have, you are okay with the reality where you don't land Knicks. If you ha- feel like you have to walk away with a quarterback there at 12, kind of like how some of the Broncos media has been talking about it. And Knicks is the one that like, you can't risk moving on. That's how it is. Then you take him at 12 and you live with what it is. I mean, if you, I think it's a big enough pick here, Carl, that if they take Knicks at 12 and he flubs, Sean Payton's not in the Hall of Fame. He's fired uh, within yep. two, three years. And uh, it's a complete, I mean, you're set the team back probably at least another two seasons uh, because a quarterback pick, just the nature of a first round pick, especially one in the top 12, they're going to get multiple seasons to get it right. Uh, unless you work your way to the number one overall pick next year and you have a Josh Rose and a Kyler Murray situation, which, has happened once. Uh, so uh, you better damn well be sure because yeah. I think for sure, if you take, if you take a quarterback there at 12, your legacy and your reputation is on the line as a hall of famer. For sure. Like if you do move back to say 25 and Nick's doesn't work out at 25 and next year you have a top five pick and one of those quarterbacks is sitting there. You don't have to feel as pressured to stick with that guy. Yeah. Like I said, you you can move on very quickly, kind of like what the Cardinals did of moving on from Josh Rose and just like, yep, we know this is not our guy. And and people can keep like Sean Payton could keep his job for an, another couple years by getting that other quarterback. But like you said, if you take him at 12, your entire legacy is tied to that quarterback at that point. He better be who you think he's going to be, especially after Sean Payton made the comments of like, we're better at this than other teams. Yeah you make those kind of ego driven comments or, or prideful comments. I, I mean, I guess it depends on the level. Like if he's right, then it's not a ego driven. It's, Hey, I just know I'm this good. And that's great. That'd be great for the Broncos because there are a lot of teams that are terrible at this. You know, we t- yeah. Bucky Brooks was just talking about this of NFL teams are terrible at setting up quarterbacks for success in the NFL. And so it's not just, Hey, this guy failed. That means he's a complete bust. He was never going to make it in the NFL. No, it just, some of them, it does mean they just went to a terrible situation and stood no chance at success. Like there's very few quarterbacks I would say are completely separate from the place that they go to. Like Peyton Manning, he's going to be successful wherever you put him. Patrick Mahomes, he's going to be successful wherever you put him. Maybe not to the level that he is with Andy Reid, but he was still always going to be successful. Because he has that that big playability off off script, he's got the arm talent, obviously, to do anything he wants on the field. I think Josh Allen, I think he's another one that I would put up there in that kind of conversation. I think he would have been successful most places that he went yeah, because he just I he think- has that drive and athleticism to do a lot of things. Yep. I mean, the arm talent plus the size plus the athleticism to size. I love RAS because it takes in the size to an account. Maybe not as important yeah. for quarterback, but I mean, that's why Anthony Richardson is just so intriguing. It's why Cam Newton is unbe- was unbelievable for his peak. Uh, that combination of arm talent plus size plus, plus athleticism is is rare. Um, and Riptide says, at least we know Nick's is smart. He's got his master's degree. I have a master's degree and I am living proof that you don't have to be smart to have a master's degree. So uh, I don't know about that. Rip die. Uh, Michael's in the house, the Ronk. Good to see you. He says, good evening. Talks about Jerry Judy signing a contract. We'll see if we have time for that today. Jerry Jackson's in the house. Good to see you. Roy Osborne. Uh, we got Adam strange in the house. Always great to see you. Ernie Mays go Broncos country only. Hello. Hello to you. Hope you're doing well. Uh, Adam asked what round Gronk was taking. And he was an early second round pick if I'm not mistaken, but definitely yeah. not a first. Um, Really, there have not been many hits on first round tight ends historically, even. Uh, it depends, I guess, what a hit is for a lot of you guys. We got Phil McLaughlin coming in saying, Good evening, Nick Carl and Deacon Scott. Scott's not here. So if there are Facebook super chats and I miss them, I apologize. We're doing the best we can. Uh, says, Of the guys we recently signed, Jones, Roach, Barton, who will benefit us the most? I guess probably I'll go with Jones because he's for sure a starter uh, in the offense right now. But, uh, I, yeah, I guess I'll, I guess I'll just have to go with Jones. 
I'll go Roach just to be different, just because Ooh. he fits. He he fills a really big need for this Broncos. You know, going from let's say um, Jonathan Harris last year to to Roach this year, like that's a huge upgrade in the run defense ability of this team. Instead of a guy that's being pushed back five yards, you got a guy that can take on double teams, split them, and still make the play himself. And that that's a huge thing for this Broncos defense right now. Yeah, it is. I he's such a weird body type though, right? Sub three hundred yeah. nose tackle. I just I I don't know. He we'll makes see. it work. Yeah, it's good. I worry that the scheme the the Saints run their defensive ends are like the size of a lot of teams' interior defensive linemen, especially with length. So I think the ability to take on blockers is a little bit alleviated. Uh, because of how big they are just across the defensive line. So I'm curious what that looks like run defense wise, being able to anchor against double teams when you're playing pipsqueaks uh, at the edge right now, compared to a lot of teams with, I mean, good, good athletes. Don't get me wrong, but small guys in uh, Benito Browning Sanders on my run defense there. Uh, Cooper small does his best setting the edge, but you do not have size and strength at edge right now. Far from I, it. I, I guess I look at just the the individual plays where, like I said, some of them he's actually being truly double teamed, yeah. taking on two three hundred pounders, and he's not getting pushed back. Like he he can actually hold his own. And then the other thing that he does so well that I, I was left impressed was his ability to know when a running back's coming and knowing when to shed a block. Mm -hmm. Like some guys are good at holding their spot, but they have no awareness of when a running back's even getting close, and so the running back just runs by him, and they're still trying to take on their blocker. And it's just like, yeah. okay, that was stupid. Yeah. Like you were just an obstacle to run around, but his ability to actually shed a guy, go make the play, or at least make a running back shift directions. So another guy can go make the play. I think that's why I feel a little bit more comfortable with them. Like I said, the size has me worried. It's an odd <sighs> outlier, but they're not paying a lot, right? It's pretty cheap. Yeah. Uh do you want to say a little more people here before we get to uh, Mel Kuyper, the Godfather's mocks? Jay Roper, good to see you, Jay. <laughs> Chase Wellner says, Carl and Nick. Chase, I'll say Chase. How you doing? Hope you're doing well. Uh, we have Chris saying, Puka had Matthew Stafford throwing him. Bowers left Jarrett Stidham. Uh, yeah, don't don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that he'll put up that stats. I'm saying the role will be different uh, for sure. But uh, Stafford is, is he the most underrated quarterback of the last 15 years? I mean, if he, if he had finished out his career in Detroit, people would have always talked about him kind of like how they're talking about Justin Herbert right now, all these tools, but what did it lead up to? Well, the team is pretty darn, butt around him, uh, back to the Manhattan yeah. a-hole, uh, all surrounding him. Uh, so I think that, uh, he's really good. And hopefully the Broncos can eventually, if they did take Bowers, that means Jarrett Stidham year one, hopefully it's a 15 year career, right? Where eventually you get it right. And then, you can take off. Yeah, you're you're bringing them in, like you said, because you see the talent and you're viewing it beyond just this season. Like he can help this year, but you're viewing it as what, what can he do for us in years two, three, four, five and beyond? Like we, we view this as a building block for the next 10 years, not just 2024. Yeah, you hope this team needs building blocks. Yeah, I listened. I mean, you listen to Daniel Jeremiah, who. We just talked about he did a team building block and it's dire for the Broncos right now in terms of actual building blocks on this team, but they don't have a lot of guys that are going to be committed to here pretty soon. And they're going to hopefully get their draft picks settled and right. And maybe even add some if they trade back. So they better damn well hit well above average in terms of the evaluations uh, going forward. And if they do that, they can get back on track and you see teams all the time. They'll get one spectacular draft class and boom, off to the races. Think your fortunes can turn around pretty quickly in the NFL. It's actually honestly one reason that it's so surprising the Broncos have had such a terrible playoff drought. Uh, but we'll see. And speaking of trading back, Gary Palmer, 999 says, I'd love to trade back, but not sure it'll happen. Go Broncos. I think that there's a chance that there's somebody's going to call to offer trade back. I don't know if Carl, you probably saw the PFF mock where they had the Broncos trading back with, I don't even remember who it was, but all the way to like pick 26, uh, 22, 26, and they had the Broncos getting 22 plus a second round pick and giving up 12 and a future third. I mean, that's that's terrible value. No, thank you. I, that would click up, hang up so fast if that's what you were asking for to move back 10 spots in the first round when there's 
probably only 16 first round graded guys to move back into the mid twenties. Hell no. Uh, yeah. But it takes two to tango. They'll, there will be calls. Is there a call that's worth the value to move back? That's the question. Yeah, I'm with you there. I, I think the Broncos can be selective because like I said, there, there's going to be a really good player that falls to you there at 12 at a pretty premium position. I would guess, you know, wide receiver, offensive tackle edge, Corner. Corner. I'll throw that in there. I, I hope I'm leaning. I hope the Broncos don't go corner. Not because I don't think they need one, just because cornerback just gets so lost when you don't have a defensive line to do anything with them. But we got Mike Edel coming in with a $10 super. Thank you so much saying, Hey, Nick and Carl in Broncos country. I have a feeling the Vikings are going to trade Justin Jefferson to either the chargers or the cards with the 11 and 23 to get ahead of us. Great show guys. I think that would be a terrible mistake on their part. Like you have a legit, a legit wide receiver. Number one that has the argument to maybe be the best wide receiver in football. And you're doing this trade up to go get a quarterback. And then you're leaving them without their most valuable piece to help them actually develop. Yeah. And so, yeah, if I'm the Vikings, I'm saying I'm willing to trade 11, 23 in my 2025 first round pick. And maybe some more. I'm not going to sacrifice one of my true best players on this roster that can actually help my quarterback to go do that kind of move. Third most valuable position in football, in my opinion, the number one wide receiver. And the only time it really makes sense to pay those guys if you get a rookie quarterback uh, in there to offset the costs. That sets up nicely for the Vikings. They have a lot of picks and they have the means and the desire to move up for a guy. Do they want McCarthy? Do they want May? I don't know. They're going to have to pay pretty darn heavy to move the Cardinals or the Patriots or the Chargers off of three, four, five. I think they'll get it done. Uh, that's a motivated team, and there's just a lot going on there. So we'll see. I don't think they'll have to give up Justin Jefferson. His contract is the real kicker for me here, though, uh, Carl, is if that contract is so big, they're like, I just, we can't do it for a wide receiver. Maybe, maybe we reached that point. Hopefully I didn't uh, get disconnected there for a second, but he's going to get paid unbelievable. Apparently they already offered him the biggest wide receiver contract of all time. And he turned it down. So, Oof. I mean, what's he looking for? Probably a lot of guarantees in there. Maybe there's something there where they do it just because the contract stuff, but uh, Justin Jefferson, I mean, for, if there was a non quarterback redraft of the entire league, Jefferson would have to be, I'm just thinking off the top of my head right now. I'd have to go through the positions and like the data and everything like this. He might be my number two overall player on my big board. Might be. Who'd be your number I, I mean, one? Maybe three, actually. Um, number one would be Miles Garrett. Okay. Number two would probably was... Micah Parsons. It's it's a it's a conversation between Parsons and uh, Justin Jefferson for me. Yeah. I, I don't know if you give that up, man. I, I wouldn't, like I said, for me, if I'm bringing a, a rookie wide receiver, we just talked about this. Teams have done a terrible job of setting up a lot of rookie quarterbacks for success. And one of the ways they do that, I, I look at Bryce Young with Panthers. They traded their number one wide receiver to go get their quarterback. And then they had nothing around him to even give him a chance at being successful. And I just, I think that was a huge mistake. I get it. Like they wanted to go get their guy, mm -hmm. but when you haven't set them up for an opportunity to go do something, it just, like I said, it takes a, a Peyton Manning, a Patrick Mahomes kind of level of talent to actually still be good when you don't have enough pieces around them. You know, like Joe Burrow, I love what Cincinnati Bengals did. You, you draft Joe Burrow. Let's go get his number one wide receiver, number one wide receiver of that draft, Jamar Chase, to give him a true, legit number one wide receiver. And, and Joe Burrow just took off all of a sudden once that happened. Yeah. And they had other wide receivers. Like, they had a lot of talent around him to make him great. Now, he is a great quarterback, but they helped him. And that, that's, you know, if Broncos do decide, this guy we're going to talk about, Bo Nix. Yep. If they do decide to go get Bo Nix, like I want them to go and make sure that I, I'm not trying to sacrifice the defense, 
but I'm trying to say, okay, let's go, let's go get us an offensive line that we can feel really comfortable with. Let's go get a number one wide receiver next year in the draft. Like I, I would be leaning offensive tackle or a wide receiver next year. If Bo Nix is say, we take him at 12 and the Broncos really believe in him that much. Yeah. Now, whether you believe in Bo Nix or not, I know you're not as big a believer as me. It's relative, right? Yeah. Like it's relative. He's, he's fine. I think you can yeah. get an Andy Dalton quarterback out of him. That's a, that's a fine quarterback on a rookie contract. That really, yeah. that is, but 12 but, overall. Like I said, if you're doing mm-hmm. that, then you better make sure that you give him the pieces around him just to see if he can actually be that for you. Yeah. They talk about eliminating the excuses or uh, minimizing the variables. I can't remember the exact phrase, but you, you want to separate the reasons from the excuses. And by doing that, you want to give them the best offensive line possible, the best wide receivers possible. So that way, if they fail, it's their failure. Uh, so you isolate the variable. My guess comes in. What's up, bro? Carl, Nick, Scott, Dylan, Broncos country. What's up, my guest? Hope you're doing well. I saw our guy, Patrick Wiltsey, gifts from the gods. I got a lion coffee shipment today. I met, I set out out to the ether on Monday. Like Patrick, I'm down to my final bag. And I, I am, I am scared. <laughs> I am so scared what my life would be like if I did not have lion coffee. So great to see you, Patrick. God, we love it so much. My mom's been uh, saying, oh, can you send me another bag? I, I, I kind of need it right now. It was good for you, but I need it. Uh-huh. Uh, so we got more stars coming in here. Mike Edel again, I think because of the upcoming contract, he's talking about moving Justin Jefferson because of the contract yeah. they've been in conversation and there is a possibility that they do move him because of the contract. I don't know. We'll see what happens. I mean, the other team's got to pay him too, but damn, he's just, again, if there was a redraft of the league, he'd be one of the first three to five players off the board and non quarterbacks. Of course, if there was a redraft of the league, the first 10 picks would be quarterbacks, maybe even 15. Um, but we got, uh, Ben Frank says we need another Talib Harris tandem. Get another cornerback in here would be great. I but, just worry that without Derek Wolf, Malik Jackson, Shaq Barrett, Demarcus Ware, Von Miller, Shane Ray, uh, Sylvester Williams. I, I mean, uh, we had a Walker in there too. I think it stands out to me um, that uh, not Demarcus Walker, somebody before that. But it's really hard to be a good cornerback and play man coverage like the Broncos did in that cover one if you can't get home. Yeah. And the Broncos can't get home. Yeah, I, I think about that Super Bowl. The the Broncos, they were that that was the most aggressive I'd seen them the entire season. Where they were just like, okay, cornerbacks, we're gonna trust you to hold up, but we're going to send everybody to go get Cam Newton, make him uncomfortable, make him have to throw as quickly as possible. Yep. And uh, and so they they pinned their ears back and they had the players to actually do it. Like you said, Vaughn Miller, Hall of Famer, Demarcus Ware, gonna be a Hall of Famer. Um, or yeah, yeah, he is a hall of famer. Von Miller is going to be a hall of famer. That's the way I should have said it there. And so it, it made those other guys be able to play as aggressive as they did. If they didn't have that, they would have not been able to be the defense they were. And that, that's why, again, I, I lean towards not going cornerback in this draft. Now I, it could be, again, you're in thinking, yeah, in the first, sorry, I should say that I, I just won. You just traded up for a, a cornerback in Moss last year because you really like him. You think he's going to be a great fit for this system. I want to go give that guy a chance to actually go be successful. Now, maybe they saw him this year and we're like, oh man, we made a mistake. And they're quick to move on from their mistakes and say, hey, let's just do this. But I, I just, I'd rather go ahead and try to help the defensive line if I possibly can. And there's, there's three edge guys that I really like in this draft. If you're staying at 12, that's probably one of the positions I'm leaning towards is, is edge, you know, office of tackles, another one, Garrett Bowles. How long is he really going to be here? I, I don't know, but uh, yeah. anyway, um, we did want to get to, to Bo Nix here for just a second. Yeah. God. Uh, Kuiper had Broncos going Bo Nix at 12. He said the Broncos have been quiet in free agency. Are they really comfortable going into the season with Jarrett Stidham? They're running out of options unless they can find a way to move up in the draft or they like someone from the second tier of passers. He lists second tier of passers, Nix, Penix, and Spencer Rattler are the likely off the board by the time the Broncos pick again at 76, as they don't own a second rounder. Uh, could, so Sean Payton and company instead, could they take one here at pick round and reach on a quarterback? Uh, he then talks about Bo Nix. So uh, that's the way I'm leaning right now. Nix isn't going to be for every team, but Payton might be able to see Drew Brees. I hate that. Uh, in him, he's a fast processor who can make every throw and, 
and was one of the most productive passers in college football the past two seasons. He had 74 touchdown passes, 10 interceptions after transferring to Oregon, not from Oregon. Come on, Mel. Uh, the Ducks offense relied on quick strikes, though, and he wasn't often asked to push the ball down the field. Averaged just 6.3 air yards per attempt, which ranks 120th out of 125 quarterbacks. Taking Nix in the first round would be a way, uh, way for the Broncos to add talent. Sorry, my thing went quickly. So the Broncos there. 12 overall, Bo Nix. Uh, I think it's worth noting Daniel Jeremiah's mock he just put out. He didn't have Nix in the entire first round at all. I think a lot of people don't have Nix in the first round unless the Broncos take him at 12. I think this is a situation, Carl, where the Broncos do have likings to Knicks and people are pairing them. But I think it's like Drew Locke where, yeah, we like him, but it's not at 12. Uh, sound like the Broncos, we like Drew Locke, not at 10. Uh, so connection there for the name and the team, but maybe not the slot. It, it makes sense. And, and like I said, I I can't see the Broncos winning the bidding war to get up for one of the top four. And I don't think they would really want to. I, I don't know if I want them to. Just because, like we've already talked about, there is a lack of talent on this roster. And if you're trading the next three first round picks to go get that guy, then you've really hampered their ability to build the team around them. Mm -hmm. And I also expect good chance next year's first round pick could be a very high pick. So I really don't want to sacrifice 2025 first round pick to go get a guy. Um, I, I mean, obviously, if you're trading up that far, you really believe this is our franchise for the next 15 years. Um, but Bo Nix, I, I do think he would be a pretty darn good fit. Um, his best work as a quarterback was over the middle of the field. So I, I told you I had a few stats for you. Uh, so he had a quarterback rating of 144.5 on all throws over the middle. Now that's deep, middle, short, and behind the line of scrimmage. Um uh, on his deep throws, he was 12 of 21 for, um, I think it was 455 yards. This is all over the middle of the field. And Sean Payton likes to attack the middle of the field. Uh, had seven touchdowns, zero interceptions. Intermediate, he was 34 of, of 50 for 730 yards, 12 touchdowns, one interception, 142.1 quarterback rating. That's 10 to 20 yard throws. Short distance, that's zero to 10, 101 of 124 for 1,027 yards, six touchdowns, zero interceptions, 117.3 quarterback rating. Um, overall, like I said, he, he had 144.5 quarterback rating on all throws over the middle. So I just feel like that lines up well with what Sean Payton would love to see from his quarterback. Part of why he did not work with Russell Wilson is Wilson refused to attack the middle of the field. And I mean, I think he only had like 5% of his passes that went to the middle of the field or something like five or 6% somewhere in there. And it just drove Sean Payton nuts that he couldn't do this. Um, the other thing I like about Bo Nix is he had the second fastest time to release in the sense of as soon as he makes that decision to throw, like his, his motion is quick. Now he doesn't have as much power as a lot of these other guys, but he gets the ball out of his hand quickly. You know, we'll talk about some of the top seven he does but like i said his ability to get it out of there quick makes it where sometimes a guy like michael Penix, he has kind of a very elongated throw now he's got more power but because he's taken a little bit longer for that windup i'm not sure that that ball is actually getting there any faster from when they start their throw to when the ball's actually getting to the receiver in that kind of sense um so th these are some of these reasons that i'm actually a little bit higher on Bo Nix is because I do think he does fit well with Sean Payton. He's not Drew Brees. Those people that keep trying to make that kind of connection, he is not that quarterback. Um, but the other part of it is I do think he's an underrated athlete. Oh, he's, he's a good athlete. Yeah. He's not a special you know, he, athlete. He's not special, but I, I'd say he's, he's smart with it. Yeah, like he, he's not going to be a Jaden Daniels, but he knows when to use his athleticism to go make a play. And he does a great job of keeping his eyes down the field to to know, hey, I can go make this throw. And some of his best throws are when he's escaping the pocket and all of a sudden he fits it into a window that you're like, what the heck? Like, where's that been? Like, why can't you do that from the pocket sometimes? Uh, th there's some on the sideline that I saw that I was like, man, that was awesome. Fitted in between a a cornerback and a safety, perfect timing guy, only place that his player could go make a play. Um, and again, I, I think this is where 
so much. I believe in Sean Payton and his ability to get the most out of a quarterback. That, that's a big part of this. I think any of these quarterbacks, if they would land with Sean Payton, there, there's a better than there, there's a better chance that they're actually going to do something in the NFL. You know, I, I talked to you earlier about this. Two out of the 19 quarterbacks taken in the 2021 and 2022 draft. It's not too long ago. Only two of them are going to be starting week one, most likely, unless there's injuries. And that is Amazing. Trevor Lawrence and Brock Purdy. The first overall pick and the very last pick of a draft. Those are going to be the only two of those two drafts starting week one. Yeah, And a big part of that is quarterbacks just went to bad situations and didn't really have a chance to actually be something. I think Bo Nix could do well here in Denver. We're going to have a chance. We're going to have a chance later on to talk a little bit. Bo Nix. I think there are some tropes about him that when I watch the tape, I don't see it. Like as far as the accuracy goes, I think he's accurate, but he's not precise. A lot of passes that should be very high percentage outside the catch radius or having like not in the strike zone, having to make, catches outside your frame for an open pass against air. Uh, a lot of double clutches in there. Now he's showing off the, the big hands, love the big hands, uh, but the decisiveness not always there. And sometimes is it the playmaking or is it not trusting what you're seeing? I, I don't know. Uh, and again, it comes back to the arm talent. If he is absolutely brilliant and he blows the socks off of Sean Payton from an intelligence perspective and a work ethic, eth- yeah. ethic perspective, there's enough there from the, uh, the movement, sorry, I think it probably got to get going, um, that you can do that uh, with the arm talent. There's enough. Yeah. You, know, you have to have all those qualifiers too. So right. we're going to have a chance to talk about Bonix. Got to wrap it on up, guys. Appreciate everyone. Uh, hope you're doing well. I, I see a comment here about the pro day. I didn't think he looked that good at the pro day. I thought the ability to drive the football was like, okay, yep, it's just an okay arm. Um, I see like a if Jalen Hurts is a big athlete, the big athlete type, the power, which I love the power, the quarterback power stuff from, from Nix. If Hurts is an A, Nix is probably a B minus for that kind of size power athleticism. And then I think it's a little bit of Case Keenum arm talent, which is fine if you're brilliant. But driving the football, I don't know if I see it. So we'll see. Um, I've been wrong before and I'll be wrong again. Uh, appreciate everyone coming <laughs> in. Follow, follow Carl on Twitter. Carl's at Carl Dummer MHH. I'm at Nick Kendall MHH. Also follow us at Mile High Huddle. If you haven't done so yet, Facebook.com forward slash Mile High Huddle and Facebook.com forward slash Mile High Huddle Pod. Follow us on there. And as the ticker says here underneath, please subscribe, like, and share. Uh, guys, we got to get on out of here. Appreciate everyone coming in for the stars today. If we missed anybody on Back to the World of Baby Poop. Yep, I'm on it. Um, appreciate everyone coming in here. Have a great one. If there's anything we said on here that was pro- provocative or whatever, hit us up on Twitter. You might get a response from me at 3 a.m. Uh, with the baby feeding time and everything like that. God bless you. Uh, but Carl, appreciate you. Got to fly. Have a good one, everyone. Go Broncos. <laughs>